person that I had to deal with. I just had a broken heart that I had to have mended. You see, grief has many issues and working in the grief journey allows you to resolve those issues. Also, we learn vulnerability, which we're going to see in just a moment with our Lord and Savior Jesus. He became very vulnerable in his own grief. We're able to heal relationships in our grief. And then finally, we become what I call pioneers of compassion. In other words, when we go to grief group ourselves and we work on our own grief in an effective way, we're able to go out and help other people deal with grief. We're able to help people in our community that we're reaching out to help them deal with their grief. We're able to help the brothers and the sisters in the church deal with their own grief. You see, grief is, is universal to all humans. Our last grief group in Denver, uh, we had a grief group going before the pandemic hit. We had more visitors coming than we did Christians there because our Christians in Denver understand that they're able to reach out to people in their grief and share the gospel because of our ability, because we've dealt with our own grief. So those are some of the reasons we deal with grief. Now, I'd like you to do something very quickly here. If you're with somebody else in your home or with your, if you're by yourself, I want you to think about or share one loss in your life and how it affected you. We're only going to take one minute to do this, okay? So just turn to the person next to you or in your own mind, think about how one loss in your life has impacted your life. We're going to go for one minute. Go. You have about 30 seconds left. Okay, thank you for sharing. Uh, I know that's not enough time. One minute, certainly not enough time. But it's very interesting when I do this exercise, I do it in large workshops, um, sometimes up to three or 400 people at a time. And what happens is when people sit down with another person and share their grief, the one word that I get coming back, I always say, what just happened to this room just now when you shared your grief? The first word I almost always get is I am connected to this person. It's really interesting that there are times where we do this in large workshops and people are sitting next to a stranger and they'll turn next to, next to them to a stranger and share about grief. And after one minute, their uh, result of that is I feel connected. You see, when we share our grief with each other, it connects us to people. You want to get connected to a friend of yours? maybe a neighbor that you're reaching out to, perhaps somebody in the church that you want to get closer to, share with them about your grief. Share with them the impact of your loss. I guarantee you'll be more connected. So let's go ahead and go to the scriptures now. And I want to share with you a little bit from my book today. And these are all chapters in my book. And then what I'm going to do at the end of our workshop, about the last half hour, I'm going to share with you how do we help one another? Okay, so the first half of this workshop is on uh, chapters in the book about grief. And then we're going to talk about how do we help one another. So chapter one says um, that Jesus embraced grief, will you? You see, Jesus, as always, is our model. He's perfect in everything he does and everything he did. He was perfect in it. And we, we have a story in the scriptures that indicate to us the perfection of Jesus embracing grief. You guys know the story, don't you? John chapter 11. Jesus's great family friend, Lazarus, had died. And uh, Lazarus had two sisters, Martha and Mary. 
And when Jesus went to uh, investigate what was going on, the Bible says he walked right into his grief. The Bible says that Jesus walked right in and he didn't stand on the sidelines. He didn't stand around and watch everybody else do grief. Jesus walked right into his grief. It's amazing to me. <clears throat> How do we know Jesus walked into it? Because Jesus engaged himself with his own personal grief. You know, um, the, the Bible talks about Martha coming up to Jesus and saying, hey, Jesus, if you had been here a couple of days ago, maybe he wouldn't have died. We call that bargaining. It's very normal to bargain in your grief. It's very normal to look back into history and say, if only I had done this or done that, perhaps my loved one would not have died. God understands bargaining. It's not wrong. Um, Jesus did not rebuke Martha for doing that. But, you know, we see Jesus leaning into his pain. It's very interesting. The Bible does not say that Jesus cried at this event. You see, crying is something we can do that we can control. When you cry, you can decide when to stop crying. Jesus did not cry. The Bible says Jesus wept. You see, weeping is different than crying. Weeping is uncontrolled crying. Perhaps everybody in this room tonight has wept in their lives. I know there's been times in my life where I have wept. I've wept over my sin and I've wept over my grief. You see, Jesus wept in front of the very people that he had been sent to serve. So that tells me that Jesus was good with his grief. He understood that it was okay to engage his grief. I do this workshop all over the world. I've done it many, many, many times. And almost universally, what I hear is this. I hear either the people in the workshop say, my culture does not allow for me to be weak. Or I've often heard, my culture says men are not allowed to cry. Men have to be strong. And so I'm going to issue a challenge to all the men that are listening today. If you're a disciple today, I want to challenge you and ask you to feel your emotions. And if you want to cry, to go ahead and cry. Because you see, Jesus did. Jesus wept in front of people. That means it's okay for us to do that. So if your culture tells you it's not okay, then you can deny the culture and go ahead and be like your Lord Jesus. Jesus wept in his grief, and he was okay with that. And finally, Jesus served. You know, if you don't know what to do around people, serve people. Um, I'll never forget the night I was at my mother and father's house. My mother was about a month or so away from dying. And she got up from the sofa to go to the bathroom, and she didn't make it to the bathroom. She, um, she soiled the carpet before she got to the bathroom. And I remember all of us looking at each other, kind of frozen. We didn't quite know what to do. And yet my brother Curtis stood up in the middle of all of us, and he walked over, and he picked his mother up. And he walked her into the bathroom and cleaned her up. And then he came out, and he cleaned the carpet for us. And I learned a valuable lesson there that just like Jesus, we can always serve in our grief. Well, here's chapter two. <clears throat> excuse, excuse me. God's heart for the griever. You know, sometimes we feel like um, God's impatient with us when we're in our grief. That God's up in heaven waiting for us to get through with our grief so we can go back to being disciples. But that's not the case. The Bible is very clear, especially if you read Psalm 31. But it's all over the scriptures that God has a compassionate heart for the griever. God feels deeply for the griever, and he reaches out to the griever. God reveals himself in our grief. I remember one day I had found out from my little brother that my mother's cancer was terminal. In other words, it wasn't going to get any better. She was going to die from this disease. And I remember that night I stayed home all by myself. And I'm, I, I was walking upstairs in my home, and on the way upstairs, I collapsed in my grief. I fell down on the stairs, and I cried out to God. And I said, God, please do something about this. And even as I cried out to God, I knew it was not going to end well. And yet, in that moment, 
my God reached out to me. I felt his comfort even in my distress. I felt the hand of God on me. You see, God reveals himself to us in our grief. God's aware of our grief. He's aware of all the dynamics that go on during our grief. And God also draws near to us in our grief. If you're in grief, please continue to reach out to your God and find him draw near to you. You know, there's a couple of things I want to share with you about personal grief as well. And all of these are in the notes that I posted, just so you know. I'm going to go through them rather quickly, but you can go back over these later on. In our grief, as we are challenged and as we have to deal with grief, we have different issues that we have to work on. You know, one of those is personal grief. Um, How do we personally respond to grief? You know, we have mental challenges in grief. We can become confused or distracted in our grief. Sometimes people find it very difficult to go back to work um, and they, they get very distracted. Sometimes it's hard to engage with other people because we feel distracted and confused. So it's common to have mental issues in our grief. Some people have physical issues. You know, they, they may gain a lot of weight or they might lose a lot of weight. Some people go out and they sleep a lot, become depressed. Some people don't sleep very much at all. Some people uh, exercise a lot and some people give up exercising. So it's common to have physical issues in our grief. Certainly we all know this one, that we all have emotional issues in grief. You know, they say grief comes in waves, right? And uh, certainly that's the case. Sometimes um, grief comes in these large, large waves of emotion that just overcome us. I remember uh, about a month or so after my mom died, I was at the um, at the gymnasium and I was going to go do a workout. And I remember I hadn't really thought about her too much that day. And I remember sitting on the bench to tie my shoes up and I just started crying. I started weeping actually right there in the gymnasium. And people are looking at me like, are you okay? Um, But yeah, sometimes emotions just wave right over us and we can't do much about it. Some people fall to the ground in their grief and emotion. Other times, uh, the emotions come more like small lapping waves. Um, But emotions certainly are a challenge in our grief. Spiritual issues can come up. I know people, for instance, myself, I had a trouble. I had trouble with God. I I did not understand my God. I did not know why he allowed my mother to get lung cancer when she had never smoked in her whole life. As a matter of fact, my mom was an anti-smoker back in the 1970s before it was in vogue to be an anti-smoker. She used to embarrass me by the way she would treat other people that smoke cigarettes. Um, So, um, so, so, you know, when, when she died, I had a real problem with that and I had to talk to God. I had to be honest with God about things and that's okay. It's okay to be honest with God. If you look at the book of Psalms, you're going to find the psalmist often question God. They often, um, are very vulnerable with their emotions and their thoughts toward God. When you look at the book of Job, as a matter of fact, the vast majority of the book of Job is, um, is, is people questioning God and kind of challenging God. And God was okay with it. He, he allowed them to do that um, until the very end, like the last two chapters. God said, okay, that's enough. Now let me talk to you guys about a few things. So, But God is okay with us um, sharing our raw emotions with him. Socially, we get distant sometimes. Sometimes in grief, we, uh, we get very distant from other people. Maybe we quit coming to church um, for a while, or maybe we just quit engaging our friendships. That's very common in grief. Some people do the opposite. They get very clingy, and they want to be around people all the time. So it's very common to have social issues in grief. And if I could ask somebody out there has got their does not have their mute button on, uh, we're getting a lot of interference right now. So if I can get you to turn on that mute button, I'd appreciate it. And then finally, I want to remind everybody that while we all have commonalities in grief, we also all 
agree as unique individuals. This is very important that we understand this, that none of us grieve the way everybody else grieves. We all have unique ways of grieving. And there's a reason for that, because our grief is related to the person that we lost and our relationship with that person. So since we all have a different relationship with those that we lose, then we, all of us have grief that is unique and different. Let me give you an example. When I was a little boy, I had an aunt uh, who died, and um, I can't even tell her what her tell you what her name was. I'd never met the woman, and I think it was on my mom's side of the family, and uh, I didn't grieve at all. It didn't bother me a bit. I mean, I was sad because my mom was sad, but that was not a big deal. But then, of course, when my mother died, it was a huge deal for me. Why was it different? because I had a different relationship with the two people that passed away. So remember that we all grieve as unique individuals. Now in our book, one of the things we do is we ask people to um, examine a relationship that has been most difficult for them. We ask them to look at a relationship that's most problematic and to examine that relationship. We want them to honor the relationship that they lost. And one of the most important things they do in that relationship is a journal about the important events of the relationship. They journal about the good things that were about in that relationship and the bad things. So some of the times we don't look at those bad things about relationships. So for example, when my mother died and I went through this process, I wrote about all the great things in our relationship. I wrote about how much my mom loved me and how um, I was influenced by her love. I wrote about the fact that she came to my wedding and supported me so much. She helped me buy a home when I was a young married man. My mother was very involved in my education. Um, so those are the great things about our relationship. She was very funny. She had a great sense of humor. But also there are some bad things in our relationship. You know, my mother didn't like the fact that I became a disciple. She just never really accepted that. And that was not good for our, my whole relationship uh, with her as a Christian. We were never really able to talk much about it. So there are different things in our relationship that I wrote about. And we ask people to be honest and write about the goods and the bads. What are the good ones and what are the bad ones? And then at the end of our grief groups, we have people write what's called a grief narrative. They write a letter to their loved one. And in this letter, they write um, five different paragraphs. They write about how their loved one made them laugh and love. And that's always a really encouraging paragraph. But then they write a paragraph on their apology to their loved one. They're writing about the things that they did wrong that never got resolved. You see, in my relationship with my mother, there are things that I had done against her that I never resolved with her. There are issues in our life that for whatever reason, we just were not able to resolve them. So I had to apologize to her in my letter. You know, we also had to forgive my mom. Um, there were things that she had done against me that I needed to forgive her. She had never resolved certain things with me. Um, and so I wrote a paragraph on my forgiveness to my mother. And then I finished out the letter with a noteworthy statement something that signifies um, my loss. And then I said goodbye, not to my mother. I said goodbye to the hurts in our relationship. And that's very important. We don't say goodbye to the relationship. We say goodbye to the hurts in the relationship. And this is always a very emotional time in our grief group that we write these letters and then share the letters. And then finally, we have a chapter that's from the Bible. Um, on what I call enduring relationships. In other words, I teach from the scriptures that we actually have an ongoing relationship with those that we've lost. And we do it through a study of the book, uh, some books in the Bible on memorial stones. In other words, God uses stones and rocks to help us remember those that we've lost and to help us make decisions in our heart 
based on those people. It's really encouraging. Let me tell you a quick story and then we'll move on, okay? So here's a story about an enduring relationship that I have with my mother. My mother had been dead for about two years at this point in my life. I was writing my dissertation for my PhD. And it's a research-based book that you have to write to earn your doctorate. And so I'm, I'm, I remember I'm at the kitchen table and I'm writing this book and I got very frustrated and I, I just stood up and I said, I'm done. I'm finished with this thing. I just, I couldn't do any more of it. I was tired of it. I didn't know what I was doing very much and it was very difficult. So I decided to quit. And, um, and so I walked into the front room of my home and we have a piano there, as you can see. And on that piano is a picture of my mom and dad. And those little, um, those little vases there, those are their ashes that we have. So I walked over to this piano and I started talking to my mom, okay? <laughs> you might, if somebody had seen me, they might've thought that's really strange. But I started talking to her, I said, mom, I'm done with my education. I've done as much as I can do. I'm not going to go any further. I'm quitting. And I was very emotional. And as I was sharing this with my mom, her picture there, guess what happened? She started talking back to me. Now, she didn't talk to me verbally. Like, I didn't hear her voice. But I did hear her voice inside my heart. In other words, all of the, um, all of the lessons she had taught me in my life were starting to come back to me in my heart. And so I started hearing her words of, Tim, stop complaining. Tim, get back to work. Tim, you know you can do this. And as I spoke to her and she spoke to me in my heart, I made a decision to go back to the table and get to work again. And I ended up finishing my dissertation and uh, defended it and, became, and, and got my doctorate. Well, why did that happen? It happened because my relationship with my mom caused me to make a different decision in my heart. You see, we have an ongoing relationship with those that we lose, and we teach that in our final grief group. So by the way, as I get started on my next uh, slide here, by the way, we're going to uh, train people in your church to lead grief groups. These are groups of six to eight people that you can meet about uh, seven times in a group setting, and you basically work through the book. And uh, as you work through the book, you are able to resolve grief. So I want you to know in the coming months, your church is going to have grief groups. Um, and I'm very excited about that. And once again, somebody, uh, if somebody could please turn off their or mute their, their uh, thing, I'm hearing a lot of feedback right now. So if we could make sure all the mutes are on, that would be helpful. Thank you for doing that. Okay, now I want to shift gears into our um, last part of our, um, of our workshop today. And this is called, We Reach Out, Friends, Family, and Grief. And what I want to talk to you about today is how do we help one another in our grief? How can we help each other? How as a church can we be the kind of people that we need to be for one another in our grief? It's very important. You know, when I lost my mom and dad, I needed people to help me out. I was lost. I was in a bad way. And I know many of you right now are in a challenging situation because of your grief. So we want to be people that can help one another. Now, let me make a very important point right now. Are you ready? Everybody listen up to this one. We cannot fix each other's grief. You can't fix my grief. Sometimes what happens is we want to fix one another's grief, and you can't do that. I tell my clients all the time, I say, listen, I cannot fix your grief. I'm sorry. I will walk with you in your grief, but I cannot fix it. There's no such thing as fixing one another's grief. There's a really cool proverb in Proverbs chapter 25 in verse 20. The Bible says this, like one who takes away a garment on a cold day or like vinegar poured on a wound is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. Think about that. I don't know about you guys, but in Denver, it gets really cold in the wintertime. 
and you have to wear a garment, a coat. And it'd be like somebody coming up to me on a really cold day and grabbing my coat and running away. Or it's like pouring vinegar on an open wound. That's what it's like for people that sing songs to a heavy heart. That's fixing grief, and you can't do that to each other. And one of the ways we try to fix each other's grief is by saying things that are just not true. We start saying things. So we say things like this. We say nothing. We just don't even talk about it. So somebody lost their mom or their dad or a loved one, a sibling, and we just don't say anything. We're afraid. We're afraid if I say something, I'm going to say something wrong. So we say nothing. We don't want to do that. We can always say something. We can always say, I'm just so sorry for your loss. But don't say nothing. That doesn't help at all. Sometimes we say things like, you were lucky. Somebody once told me that. You're lucky. You're lucky you had your mom for so long. Well, that might be intellectually true, but it's emotionally barren. It's a horrible thing to say. It's as if having somebody for a certain number of years makes us lucky. I wasn't lucky that my mom died. It was very painful. So don't say that one. Here's another one we say, you should be over this by now. You know, somebody's been in grief for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and somehow we've decided how long they should be over their grief. Please don't say that to other people. You should be over this by now. If you're concerned about somebody, then you can say, you know, it's been a while. What's it been like for you? Help me understand your grief and get them talking about it. But to simply say you should be over it by now is not helpful. Here's another one. Don't feel bad. <laughs> we tell people, quit feeling bad. Don't be, don't be sad. You know, your mother wouldn't want you to be sad. Well, that's not helpful either. You're just kind of making the person feel guilty um, by saying that. And usually we say it because we feel bad. So don't do that. Here's a couple more that I want to share with you. I know how you feel. You know, we try to relate to people and we say, I know how you feel. Um, and, and as you know, you don't really know how we feel, right? I don't know how you feel. I know, I know sadness is like common, but, um, but telling people I know how you feel is kind of like taking the conversation away from them and it's placing the, uh, the spotlight on you. So don't say, I know how you feel. Here's another one. Time heals all wounds. And you know what? That's just not true. Um, time by itself does not heal wounds. Like I mentioned to you, my friend whose dad died about 20 years ago, time did not heal his wound. Now, here's what does heal wounds is if you take time and you add a grief process to time. If you take time and add grief process to it, a grief journey, then you can heal some wounds. But time all by itself does not heal wounds. Here's another one. That reminds me, I think somebody once said, that reminds me of the day my dog died when I was talking about my mom dying. You know, we have this desperate attempt to relate to people. That reminds me, don't tell people that. Because generally speaking, um, it takes the conversation away from the griever and puts it onto you. And then finally, we, we play theologian. In other words, we, um, we kind of like play God with people. We, we will make judgments on people's lives. I've had people say things like, what's it like knowing that your mom and dad are in hell now? They'll, they'll say things like that. And they play theologian with my mom and dad. And what we tell people in grief group is that our job is not to be theologians in grief. That has its place somewhere else, but not in grief. And I suppose if you have theological questions, then you should ask those, but we don't do that in grief group. In grief group, our job is to help one another deal with the loss of a relationship. So we don't play theologian. You know, Paul was very clear in, in the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 15. He commands us, he tells us to mourn with those who mourn. 
That's our job is to walk with the griever, to mourn with people that mourn. Our job is not to fix them, it's to mourn with them. It was very interesting just about a month or so ago, six weeks ago, my father-in-law lost his wife um, and she died and we went to the funeral to be with him. And when we walked into the church building, my father-in-law was standing at the front of the church building with the casket. It was an open casket funeral. And he was standing there up there by himself and he was obviously crying. He was mourning. And somebody came up to me and go, Tim, we should get somebody up there with him to comfort him. And I said, no, right now, let's allow him to mourn. Let's give him some time to process and mourn his loss. And so we allowed him to stay up there by himself for a while. And then eventually one of us went up and stood next to him. And then we mourned with him. We cried with him. We didn't pat him on the back and try to comfort him. We wanted to allow him some time to simply mourn his loss. The Bible says mourn with those who mourn. Let me close out with a few more concepts here that I think are really helpful to us on how to help one another in grief. You know, we reach out to people by being friends with people. Uh, I got this concept out of Mark chapter 2. Uh, Mark chapter 2 talks about a time when Jesus was in a home preaching, and uh, there was a, a man who, um, who was an invalid. He, he was paralyzed, and he couldn't walk. And his friends, he had four really good friends who got him up on a roof and then um, lowered him into the home in order to get healed. And Jesus had compassion on the man and healed him, right? So I believe that we need friends in our grief. Matter of fact, I came up with four different friends that we need as we grieve. So if you're in grief right now, make sure you've got these kind of people around you. If you're not in grief, but you know a griever, make sure you're one of these people for them. What are the four kinds of friends we need? First of all, we need a relator. We do need somebody in our life who's already done grief in a substantial way. We need somebody that's walked the grief journey before we have. I remember a morning about a month after my mother's funeral. I was back in Denver, and it was a Sunday morning, and I had a dream about my mom. Have you ever had a dream about your loved one? We call them grief dreams. But I had a dream about my mom that I can still, to this day, I can still feel it. I can smell it. I can see it in my mind's eye. I met my mother in her home for just a brief interchange. I walked up to her and uh, I said, Mom, how are you doing? And she said in my dream, she said, I'm fine. I'm doing good. And then I remembered I hugged her in my dream. I just hugged her and I cried and then I woke up and I sat up in bed and I, at four minutes, I thought, oh my gosh, I just met my mom and it was a dream, but it was very real. Maybe you've had those before. And I remember sitting on the edge of my bed and I just wept. I just cried for about 20 minutes and I went to church that day and it was just like the day my mom died. I felt very raw. I felt very vulnerable. It was not a good feeling, guys. And I remember I came home from church and I thought, I got to do something about this. I thought, I can't live like this the rest of my life. So I called my friend Mark Young up. You see, Mark was familiar with grief. Mark had lost a four-year-old son in a swimming pool accident years before this. And I knew Mark in his grief. So I called him up. I said, Mark, I need help. I said, I feel horrible. I feel like it's the day my mom died. And I told him my story. And he said, oh, Tim, it's going to be okay. He said, don't worry. That goes on for about a year, and then things start to get better. You see, I needed a relator in my grief. You know, we also need a friend in grief. We need somebody to just live life without grief. Sometimes in our grief, it's all we seem to do is do grief. It seems like grief colors every part of our life. 
And there are times in our losses that we need a friend to come along and just do something normal that does not have to do with grief. So we need friends, people to take us out to dinner, people to take us to a movie or just go out and talk somewhere, but just to be a friend. You know, we also need a listener. This might be the hardest person to find. We need somebody that will simply listen to us in our grief. There's been times that I've told people, I need to talk about my grief. There was one brother, you see, I'm a counselor and people expect me to listen to them, which I do a lot of, but also I'm a human being and I need someone to listen to me. So there's a brother that I told, I said, listen, um, I need you to listen to me, please. And he goes, okay. I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you out to dinner and I'm going to buy you dinner, but you have to listen to me for two hours. He goes, okay. So I took him out to a restaurant. I bought him dinner and then I started talking. And every now and then he tried to interrupt me and say, oh yeah, that reminds me of this or this. I said, no, no, David. I said, I've already pied, <laughs> buyed your, I already bought your dinner for you. Now just listen to me. And he did for two hours. He listened. Sometimes you can get some cheap uh, therapy by getting someone just to listen to you. Buy him dinner, buy him a cup of coffee, and ask them to simply listen to you. And then finally, in our grief, we often need a truth teller. We often need somebody to come back into our lives and to tell us truth. You see, sometimes in our grief, we can go, I call it going sideways. We can get in a place that's not healthy for us spiritually. Maybe we quit coming to church or maybe we, we persist in an attitude at God. Maybe we begin to distrust God or we distrust other people or maybe we're just angry. And sometimes we need a truth teller, somebody to gently come into our lives and tell us the truth, to open the scriptures and with compassion, help us with the truth. So those are four friends that all of us need in our grief. And let me remind you, if you need one of those friends, you may need to tell them what you need. And if you're going to be one of those friends, please be that for the griever. Here's my final slide here for helping a grieving friend. You know, these are just some more thoughts on how do we help one another in our grief. You know, first of all, timing is really important. Um, oftentimes, after we have a loss in our life, we get a lot of support for the first two weeks. You know, people bring over a lot of food to the house. Maybe you get a lot of sympathy cards in the mail. At church, a lot of people are hugging you and praying for you, and there's a lot of support. But it's that third week when everybody goes home and everybody pretty much forgets about your loss. And you wake up and you realize, I'm never going to see this person again. I remember that morning I woke up after about three weeks and I realized I'm never going to see my mom again. That's when I try to jump in and reach out to the griever is after that second week or so. Timing is very important. So what I do is I wait a couple weeks and then I initiate with the griever. And that's when I say, hey, can I take you out to dinner? Can I take you for a cup of coffee? And I want to listen to you. Maybe that's when I send the card is a couple weeks later. So think about timing and how that can help somebody uh, further down the road. You know, another important thing is a, having a safe and confidential environment. In other words, when you ask people about their grief, you don't want to do it in a crowded fellowship room. You don't want to do it when a lot of people are standing around. If you're going to ask somebody about their grief, do it in a place and in a way that they can really open up with you. You know, take them to the back of the auditorium where nobody's standing around and then ask them about their grief. Take them out to Starbucks or somewhere to talk to them in a way that they have a safe place to talk. And maybe if they need to be emotional, they can be emotional. So create a safe and confidential environment. Here's another one. Listen and learn. You know, like I said, all of our grief is different. So my job is to listen and learn. I want to ask them faithful questions about their grief. So I ask questions that are faithful. I ask questions like, can you tell me about your dad? What was he like? What are your favorite memories of your dad? 
What are some of the best things you guys did together? What are some of the hard things in your relationship with your dad? What was it you didn't like about him? You see, I ask faithful questions that get my friend to talk. And if I can listen and learn by using faithful questions, then I'm going to really help that person out. Most of us want to talk about our loved one. We just need a good place to do so. Here's another one. Hold the moment. You notice I have this one in red. Why is it in red? Because it's very important. So I'm going to tell you a story right now, okay? This is called holding the emotional moment. I want to talk to you about the importance of learning how to hold on to emotional moments. Here's my story. After my mother died, um, in our church in Denver, we have what's called Mother's Day. It's a big thing in the U.S. I don't know if you do it in South Africa or not, but in the U.S., every uh, May, uh, there's Mother's Day on Sunday. And you go to church, and um, everybody's all dressed up. And what they do, they have a song. <coughs> it's called the Mama Song. And the brothers get up, and they sing this very um, soulful song about mama, about mothers. And it's really great. It's a very emotional song. And then they, so they sing that. And then the little kids get up, and they pass out flowers to their moms. So it's really a great day. It's very encouraging unless you don't have a mom. And so what I did every year for several years during this time, I would leave church and go out in the lobby and just stand around. I just couldn't do it anymore. I didn't want to be emotional. I had not learned how to hold on to my own emotional moment. Well, finally, a couple years ago, I came to church on Sunday and there were the brothers practicing the mama song. And God spoke to me and I decided I'm going to stay in church today the whole way through, no matter what happens. I, I, I thought, you know what? If I cry, that's okay. It would be an honor for my mom for me to cry if that's what happens. So I stayed in church. I sat next to my mentor, uh, my fellow elder, Greg Jackson. And I just decided that if I'm going to cry, I'm going to cry. Jesus cried so I can cry. And that's what I did. They sang the song. The little kids passed out flowers, and I sat there and cried. <laughs> and you know what? I lived. I lived through the day. It was okay. And now every Mother's Day, I stay in church. I learned to hold on to my emotional moment. Well, let me tell you part two of my story. A couple of months later in our church in Denver, we had a young man commit suicide. A young man who was about 19 years old. He was the son of very good friends of ours who had been disciples for 40 years. And this young man had a mental health disease. Um, he was depressed and he found a gun and he killed himself. It was devastating to the church. Um, everybody knew this young man. The family's very well known in our church. And um, it was very difficult. Well, a couple of uh, weeks after the funeral, the Bible talk leader of this family called me up and he said, hey, Tim, would you come and do a Bible talk on social grief? We don't know what to do with these parents. It's very difficult. We're, we want to learn how to help them. So I came over and I did this Bible talk on social grief and the boy's parents were there. The young man's name was Nick, by the way. And his mom is Rachel. And by the way, Rachel is giving me permission to share the story. So after the Bible talk, Rachel came up to me. And Rachel's son, Nick, had killed himself. And Rachel was emotional. And as we started talking, she was crying the whole time. And she was saying things like this. She goes, Tim, I need Nick to come home. He needs to come back. I need him back home right now. And it was very difficult to listen to her say these things because Nick had killed himself. And she just kept saying it over and over. I need Nick to come home. And what was my temptation? My temptation was to correct her because it was very uncomfortable to hear her saying these words. But since I had learned to hold on to my own emotional moment, I was able to hold on to Rachel's emotional moments. In other words, as she shared emotionally about her loss of her son, I simply stood there and listened to her. I did not correct her. I was tempted to say, Rachel, your son's not coming home. 
but I did not say that. I simply stood with her and I cried with her. I mourned with her. And it was very interesting. After about 15 minutes of this time, she finally came around and said, you know, Tim, I just miss my son. I just missed him. And she became much more rational. And I learned a valuable lesson, you guys, that if we will allow other people to share their emotions, we can help them. We have to learn to hold on to emotional moments. Two more things, and then I'll be finished. Another thing we can do to help a grieving friend is to love and act. You know, here's what I mean by this one. We need to love and act. Um, Oftentimes at a funeral, we walk up to the person and we'll say this. We'll say, I'm really sorry for your loss. If I can do anything for you, let me know. Now, that's, that's said out of a good heart, I believe. But what happens is you're putting, you're putting a burden on the griever by saying, if I can do something for you, you let me know. We put a burden on them. And I've found that they never call me for anything. I've never... I can't think of a time anybody's ever called me. Maybe for you they have, but they never seem to follow up on that because I put a burden on them. So here's what I do now. Instead of doing that, I will come up to them and I'll think about, before I talk to them, I'll think about what do they need? And then I'll make a decision to do something for them. So I might walk up to a grieving woman who's lost her husband and maybe she has three small children at home. And I might walk up to her and say, hey, I'm really sorry for your loss. Here's what I'd like to do. I'm going to come over on Wednesday night and pick up your children and take them out to dinner. And you can have a couple of hours at home by yourself. Would you like that? And what I've done is I've told them how I'm going to love them. And most of the time they say, oh, that's a great idea. Please do so. And I come over on Wednesday night pick up the kids, take them to dinner, and give her some time by herself. You see, when we want to help a grieving friend, the best thing to do is love by acting. Do something for them. Don't put the burden on them to come up with something. And then finally, church, we have to have a hopeful heart. You see, this is really difficult work, isn't it? Getting in there and loving the griever is a difficult thing to do. It is not easy. It's hard work. And if we're going to be good at doing this kind of work, we have to have a hopeful heart. We have to have a heart that trusts, a heart that's in the scriptures for ourselves so that we can get strong and loving and compassionate to help other people. So I'm going to close out by saying, have a hopeful heart when you're helping the griever. So that's my presentation for today. I really am grateful for you listening. I want to remind you of a couple things, and then we're going to go jump on some questions here in just a moment. So if you have questions, um, go to the chat room and write them in the chat room. Um, you can just write any question you want, and I'll answer it. Um, try to keep it general in nature, if you would, so that everybody benefits. So we're going to get to the questions in just a moment. I want to remind you that um, if you'd like to get the Grief Journey book, you can go to ipibooks.com. It's a, uh, an International Church of Christ website. Uh, with It's a bookstore, actually. Uh, ipibooks.com. And if you look for the Africa ebook, the Grief Journey Africa ebook, you'll see, uh, you'll see an ebook you can buy for $4. We worked out a deal to do that. Um, so again, if you, if you uh, simply go to ipibooks.com, Go to Africa ebook. You can download the book, and then all you need to do is have your own journal to write in um, because it is a journaling book as well. Also, if you want the class notes and you weren't able to get them off the chat room, you can go to inmotioncounseling.org. On inmotioncounseling.org, it's my website. And um, there's also a button you can hit to sign up for a free weekly uh, blog on mental health in the church setting. So every week on Tuesdays, I send out an email, a blog that just discusses different aspects of mental health and how in the church setting, we can help one another. So that's at inmotioncounseling.org. Uh, again, you can get the notes to the class or and or you can sign up for your weekly blog 
um, just by putting in an email address. So I'm going to get off this right now and go to the chat room and see if there's any questions that you guys have got to ask. Oh, there are some, I think. All right. Good to see everybody again. Uh, Dr. Tim, just before yes. we get to, to the questions, uh, let me just jump in there. Thank you so much uh, for just facilitating this great uh, needed uh, workshop. Uh, we've certainly learned a lot uh, from your sharing and uh, thank you so much. Um, I think just as you have announced, uh, we'll, we'll go for a Q&A uh, right now, but I just wanted to jump in there and just say thank you for a great job. Uh, in presenting this uh, very, very difficult topic uh, of grief. Uh, I think we'll jump into uh, questions. Uh, we have directed people uh, to send you directly a uh, question you should have received a couple. And uh, Renee will help me if there's any on the group chat uh, that you miss. Uh, over to you again, Dr. Tim. Great. Thank you for those kind words. And um... I just want to make one quick correction in the um, chat room. Somebody mentioned that the the uh, my um, website it's inmotioncounseling.org. So I, I I just rewrote it in there for you. But anyways, um, so yeah, some really good questions here. Um, one person said um, they just made a comment about the ongoing relationship that they're not aware that it's a, a normal thing. It's not really normal. A lot of people don't talk about it. Um, but in traditional grief counseling, the idea was, uh, it's called acceptance. The idea was you accept your loss and then move on. And, and basically the idea was that you just don't want to think about those people anymore. So, um, what, what I did in the scriptures, God's not like that. God, God wants us to honor and to think about, um, those that we've lost. And it's very important that we learn lessons from those that we've lost. So, um, so that was a good question there. Um, let's see here. Let me find another one. Okay, here's what it says. I just want to find out if grieving influenced by factors such as age, gender, educational background, and social status. Is there any relationship? Actually, what grief is, it's a good question. Grief is really an impacted the most about by the relationship you had with that person. So, um, you know, sometimes the way you lose people can impact your grief. So it's different. For instance, my mom died and I knew she's going to die for a couple of months. Um, so that kind of helped me to prepare for her death because I knew she was going to die. Other people, though, um, if somebody dies in a car accident, that's different because it's very sudden and, um, and that will impact your grief as well. But generally speaking, um, you know, I don't think gender has much to do with the way we grieve. I don't think educational background does or social status. Certainly age does. You know, uh, younger people grieve differently. Um, and if you have a child that you want to help in grief, I would recommend you just Google the word, you know, child in grief. And there's a lot of good information on how to help a child in grief. Um, so here's one. I'm so sorry about that. It says, we recently lost a dear sister in our midst of COVID-19. This happened during the lockdown and we could, uh, we could visit her in the hospital. We could not come together for her funeral. How can we have closure as a church? I'm so sorry to hear that, you guys. Um, that breaks my heart to know that we lost a sister to, to that COVID-19. Um, you know, it's really hard because you do want the church to grieve together. Um, you know, the story I told you about Nick killing himself, that Sunday, their whole family came to church and we announced it at church. And then we just had a time for about 30 minutes of people surrounding the family, grieving with the family, crying with the family. Um, it was really important for us to grieve as a church. Um, it seems like um, the only thing I could mention for that is maybe you can do a Zoom meeting um, to talk about that, um, specifically have a celebration of her life um, and everybody process on Zoom, that might be really helpful. Um, if not that, you may have to wait until, um, you know, until you can get back together again. But 
we in in the in the U.S. we don't have any time to get back together yet. We're going to be on lockdown for another couple of months, so I would encourage you to maybe do a Zoom meeting for that. Um, okay, let's see here. Um, you guys have a lot of very encouraging words. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, oh, I just got blessed by God. That was good. Thank you. Uh, is there a difference in the grief process between grieving loss of living relationships uh, versus relationships of family who passed away? So like the difference between divorce and somebody who passed away, you know, it, of course, there's some differences there. Um, in a in a divorce or an ab abandonment, uh, it's the same thing as kind of like when you have an abortion or if you lose a child in childbirth. What you're grieving is the future. So when you have somebody that abandons you or divorces you or you lose somebody before they get to live, what you're grieving is possible future that you're never going to have. So you're grieving the future of that loss of relationship. With people that are living that have passed away, oftentimes the grief is focused on what you've lost already, like the past relationship. And so that's the difference. We do have people come to grief group for divorces and abandonment issues or for abortions. And they have to, um, they have to tweak the, the book a little bit uh, to make it fit for them because the book does center itself on people that have died. But, um, but certainly there, everything that you lose is very difficult. And I don't ever minimize people's losses. In other words, we never want to minimize what we've lost because somebody else lost something greater. So sometimes people say, well, you know, I had my mom for 50 years of my life, so I shouldn't be that sad because here's a teenager that lost his mom after 10 years, right? But that's not good. We don't want to compare our losses to one another. We ask people to take each loss for what it represents and to grieve that loss individually. Um, my mom passed, then three months afterwards, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. How do I deal with both at the same time? Well, the only thing I could encourage you there, and I'm really sorry that you're going through that, is, you know, certainly you have to take care of your own body first. You know, when you get on an airplane and um, the stewardess says, you know, they do the thing about if we get in a crash, here's what you do. They always say the oxygen mask is going to come down. And put yours on first before you put on your kid's mask. And that's a good metaphor is we have to take care of ourselves first before we can take care of other things. So I'd encourage you to take care of your autoimmune disease uh, first priority. And then when appropriate, you can deal with the loss of your mother. And again, I'm just so sorry that you've lost her. Um, that's, that's always very difficult. Here's a good one. How does one grieve if you have compounded grief, losing many people over a short space of time? So that's a really important question. Um, when you've got several losses in your life, what we ask people to do in the grief group is we ask them to take the loss that's most problematic to them. So they, we ask them to take the loss that means the most or that's most difficult and to process that one by itself and to put the other ones aside for a little while. What happens is if you can do that successfully, then you now have a template for the other losses. Um, but it's, it's, it's really impossible to try to grieve all the losses at once. You can't do it. Because remember, the loss that you have is a loss of an individual relationship. And so you can't grieve a lot of individual relationships all at once. So take the one that's most problematic to you, the one that hurts the most and do that one first, and then that will help you with the other ones. So here's somebody that just asking about, um, she has a friend who believes in signs, um, that if she sees a flower, it represents something to her. That's okay. You know, when I had a dream about my mom, 
I don't care what anybody thinks about it. It's none of your business. <laughs> if you have a dream or if something means something to you, then that's fine. Listen, you look in the scriptures, God's always, um, he's always using metaphors like for flowers and grass and trees. Um, so if you see something that reminds you about your loved one, just accept it for what it is. Don't judge it. Please don't judge each other in our grief. You know, if people have certain meanings for things, that's okay. As long as they're not, you know, like worshiping an idol or something like that. But let people have their, uh, their moments, okay? Um, oh, we all go through denial as a, a defense mechanism. When is grief unresolved? That one doesn't acknowledge the reality. Um, how do you say goodbye, but not to the relationship? See, that's the important thing there right now. First of all, denial is really important. Um, denial is normal. It's what our body does to us when we hear something that's too difficult to take on. So it was really interesting. When, when my mom died, um, I got a phone call about 6 a.m. in the morning. My father was calling me to tell me that my mom just passed away. And I knew she was going to be dying. Um, I, I was well aware of that. But the very first thing I said was, are you sure? That was a denial. You see, deny, denying something is very common. It's your body's way of protecting you. So when people go through denial, that's real normal. It's very acceptable. Um, obviously, at some point, they have to move on from that. But at the beginning, almost everybody goes through some kind of denial in their life. And don't, don't try to force people uh, away from that at the very beginning. Let them have that time. It's just a normal thing. Um, so, and then, and then the second part of your question is, how do you say goodbye, but not to the relationship? That's exactly what we do in the book. We say goodbye to the hurts in the relationship. That's what we're saying goodbye to. We say goodbye to the hurt, but we don't say goodbye to the relationship. Super important, guys. I have not said goodbye to my mom and dad yet, and I won't because I have an ongoing relationship with them both. What we say goodbye to are the hurts in the relationship. Okay, and that's what the book spells that out very clearly. Um, how, do you, how do you help a person who has lost their loved one but no longer wants to pursue a relationship with you after their loved one has died. That's kind of a specific question. I'm not sure enough about the relationships. Um, but guys, you know, the only thing I can say there is just, um, you know, we have to be patient with one another in grief. We really do. Um, we, we, we have to be patient. We have to give people a lot of room. Uh, it's the most difficult thing they've ever gone through in their lives, especially if you personally have not gone through a big one yet. You see, I, I led grief groups for many years before my mom died. And after she died, my attitude changed dramatically after I lost my mom. I had had many people die that I knew. After we lose a significant loved one, usually we change a lot in, in regards to how we treat each other. Um, so be patient with one another. What's the difference between consulting a medium to talk to our past loved ones, which we're not allowed to do, and talking to our loved ones while at home or at the gravesite? That's a good question, and I've been asked that quite a bit. And I certainly don't think we should be consulting any mediums. I don't, I don't personally believe that I talk to my mom like in the present tense. But when I, in that story I shared, I was pouring my heart out. And as I did that, the memories of her words came back to me. And that's what's important. So I don't believe in, in you know, like mediums, or I don't believe in any of that kind of thing. Uh, although it is in the scriptures, you know, Samuel consulted a medium. I'm not saying it's right, but it is what happens. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm getting ready to go to Washington D.C. to visit um, to visit my mom and dad's cemetery where they were buried, and I go out there and I spend some time with them. I, I go out and I, I spend a couple hours at the cemetery, and I pray. I talk to God quite a bit, um, and I, I I do talk to my mom and dad. Now I, I'm not saying they 
hear me per se, but it helps me to process my loss just by talking to them. And um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, so yeah, but just, you, you know, I'm clear that I don't consult mediums or I don't, I don't think I'm like visiting the spiritual world or something like that. Um, but that's just where I am on that one. Uh, Dr. Tim. Yes. Uh, can we, I'm, I'm just, uh, uh, looking at also time. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, we won't be able obviously to look at, uh, every question. Uh, can we just take uh, one more uh, yeah. and then uh, so that we, we can just uh, wrap up for today? Very good. Yeah, I think there's just uh, one more anyway, so that's really good. Um, um, uh, here's, uh, here's somebody, really interesting comment. Uh, I read something on a website once that grief is love which you never had the chance to express. Yeah, that's a really good, uh, really good comment, really good um, expression, good way to end up. You know, somebody also once said, um, with great love comes great pain. And I think that's the essence of what we do in grief is we are trying to express ourselves to a very important relationship that we've lost. We're trying to figure out how do I live my life without this relationship anymore. And you know, if you think about it for a minute, the Bible is full of stories. Matter of fact, the Bible is more stories than anything else. When God chose to reveal himself to us, how did he do it? He did it through storytelling about relationships. Think about it. The Old Testament and the New Testament is full. It's almost all relationships. Jesus's relationship with the disciples, Paul's relationship with churches. In the Old Testament, it's story after story after story about people's relationships with one another and their relationships with God. So when God chose to communicate to us, he does it through relationships, right? So what that tells me is that our relationships are vital it's how God has us live our lives is through one another relationships. So when we lose a relationship, it's important that we spend time processing that. And that's what the grief journey is all about. So uh, Renee, that was your question. Thank you very much for asking that. And again, I want to just lift Renee up for her faith in um, getting this whole thing organized. You guys, thanks so much for all your great questions. Um, please go to the website to get the book, ipibooks.com. Or go to my website to get the notes. And I'm going to turn it back over to your fearless leaders. And uh, I hope to meet you in person someday. Love you all. Lovely, lovely. Thank, thank you so you much. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, my brother. Uh, we, we also do know that, um, uh, you know, you train groups uh, to, uh, for, for, for different churches to deal with the grief journey. And uh, we want to present the same opportunity for uh, our churches, the site. Uh, my email and Renee's email is on um, the, the chat group. Uh, you can just check uh, the, our emails. My email is mpokalo uh, at uh, uh, mpokalo.mk at gmail.com. Renee is renee1 at, at gmail.com. Uh, send your name, your region, if you really want to be trained. Uh, and then we can facilitate with your regional leader uh, and we can get uh, everybody trained within their regions uh, to help with uh, grief uh, in the various regions. As uh, uh, it has uh, been said, uh, grief is what we will deal with, uh, you know, uh, from, from past, present and future. We'll always be dealing with grief. And of course, we need people who uh, are trained through the grief journey. Uh, to be helping as much as possible uh, throughout all our, all our regions. So uh, send your name, send your uh, region where you're from uh, to my email, to Renee's email, and I'll facilitate with the regional leaders. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have a great time uh, doing that together. Uh, again, thank you so much, Dr. Tim, for facilitating this workshop. Uh, we are really encouraged um, uh, we, we've got a point of departure in terms of how to deal 
with grief and uh, we will grow uh, in helping one another to deal with it, uh, both in our personal spaces, but also socially with one another. Uh, let me also take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, the committee that organized uh, 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 this uh, 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 grief workshop, uh, Renee, uh, Asanda, John, uh, Dr. Mimi, uh, let me not leave anyone, uh, yeah, Pumla, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and everybody else that, that has uh, really uh, come through to, to uh, help with, with this workshop. I uh, thank you so much. Uh, we really, really appreciate your, your hard work in organizing this workshop. Uh, at this point in time, I'm going to close off with a word of prayer, and uh, that will be it. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to everyone, each and every one of you that came through uh, for this workshop. Uh, may God uh, continue to comfort you when you're going through your grief. If you are going through your current grief or someone in the church, let's continue to pray for one another. Let's relate. Let's be friends. Let's be able to have good timing and all the lessons that I learned uh, today. I'm going to close off with the word of prayer and that will be it for today. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord Almighty God, thank you so much for the time you've given us uh, this uh, late afternoon. Uh, thank you, Honorable Father God, for using Dr. Tim in such a powerful way in helping uh, us um, you know, know more about grief in facilitating this workshop, Heavenly Father, so that we can be able to deal better uh, with grief. Heavenly Father God, we thank you uh, that you wept. Uh, if anything that I find comforting in the scriptures is exactly that verse, Father, that you wept, that you're so relatable, that uh, you, you are able to be where we are at. Uh, Heavenly Father, to Thomas, you said he must put his fingers uh, into your hands. Uh, you wanted him to, you came down to his level so that he may be able to feel and be able to deal with his grief in his own way, Father. And you are able to go down to our level uh, to help us deal with grief as well. Father, uh, guide us always, Heavenly Father. Continue to equip us, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, continue to comfort us uh, in our moment of pain and loss. Uh, help us, Heavenly Father, to get through each day with you. It is in your son's name, Jesus Christ, I pray all these things. Amen. 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 Uh, Thanks, guys. Love really you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Stop. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Asanda. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Amen. Thanks, bro. Um, yeah. So I think if if the way forward, if um, uh, the recording could be shared uh on email and then we can post it on the different sites and whoever's um uh requested we can share with people the recording i think there were people who jumped in a little bit later mm -hmm. so i've had already some requests and yeah thank you so much everyone thank you so much renee thank you thank you, thank you. Well, Tamimi, thank you. Sanda, thank you. Thank you, guys. Lovely. Uh, Matthew? Matthew? Yes, yes. Matthew. Thank you. Thank you, that, uh, Matthew, man. Okay. Yeah, really appreciate no, it, man. No problem. Yeah. I'm multitasking. I'm at place and I'm on the phone as well. Wow. Thank yeah. you for multitasking, man. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Okay. okay. Bye, right. guys. We'll be in touch. Uh, thank you. Thanks to Matthew as well. Bye-bye. Yeah. I'm going to sign off now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Oh, that's too late. Yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, right. my brother. It's, 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 it's dark, you can see. Ah, oh, oh no. My brother, I'm sorry, my brother. Yeah, and we're in the same boat, I'm sorry. Hey. Yeah, it looks like you're going to be my best friend lately. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely, man. Yo, I cry for that. I cry. All right, thanks. Thanks, man. Did you tune in today? Mm, thanks. Stop. Did you tune in? No, I didn't Were tune in. in Ponga Mayfield is next to me. Oh, okay. Were you able to... But the recording is will be made available, eh? Uh, I think so. Yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Super, man. Thank you, right. thank you, thank you. Cheers, Alan. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much.